Welcome to Her Story on a Plate, a place for real talk about real bodies. Let's dish about our complex relationships to food and bodies. We are two experts in the field coming at this from an anti-diet, your body holds wisdom approach. This podcast is all about changing the conversation we have in our heads and culture so that we can embrace ourselves fully. We are delighted to have Betsy Brenner with us today. Betsy is an author, recovery speaker, and peer support mentor. In her 2021 memoir, The Longest Match, Rallying to Defeat an Eating Disorder in Midlife, Betsy details her life, a life filled with blessings and privilege, but also with emotional trauma, profound grief, anxiety, depression, and ultimately a diagnosis of anorexia in midlife. Her eating disorder became the catalyst for healing. Betsy's inspiring message is that it is never too late to be a work in progress. Her recovery journey shows us that it is possible to heal from past trauma and become healthier in mind, body, and spirit. Today's episode is so important because we really dive into what disordered eating looks like for women in midlife. And it's not what you might think. It's actually not about the food. Welcome, Betsy. We're so glad you're here. Betsy, I'm wondering if you could start us off with telling us a little bit about your book and what inspired you to write it. That's a great question. My book is The Longest Match, Rallying to Defeat an Eating Disorder in Midlife. To be completely honest, I never planned to write a book. I never envisioned becoming an author. I had written my recovery story from my eating disorder several years ago, and I had been told that my life story had the makings of a book if I was willing to put the time and effort into it. But I certainly didn't have the time, and I couldn't imagine putting the effort into it until March of 2020 when life as we knew it shut down. And I wrote my entire manuscript from March of 2020 to January of 2021, and my book was published in May of 2021. I never planned for any of this, but I could not be more grateful for how things have unfolded. What a quick trajectory. I mean, that's remarkable. You were one of those people. You finished it just in time for the first round of vaccinations. That was great. Okay. (laughs) There you go. It just (laughs) happened. Yes. So that's sort of the mechanics of it, right? But the story of the book is really quite remarkable and something that I think encapsulates so well what Nina and I both work with on a daily basis all the time, which is. I'll tell you how I see it, you tell me if this is what you meant, that it's really about disordered eating across really a very wide spectrum of what we call disordered eating. And, you know, statistically, of course, it can happen to anyone, but it does seem to show itself so much more in women and females in general. And that there's this this sector of the population that is sort of forgotten about. I think when you say to the average person the word eating disorder, they think of, with due respect, a 16-year-old skinny white female with privilege stopped eating. And I don't say that with insensitivity, but that is really what they think of. And so I'm wondering if you can sort of give us a little bit of a story about when your own disordered eating began, and just a a little story about how you finally got to treatment or whatever level of of peace that you've come to with it. Well, I have to admit that I too had those same preconceived notions. When I was Mm -hmm. diagnosed with anorexia in my Mm mid-40s, I thought I couldn't have anorexia. You know, I'm a woman in my mid-40s, mother of three, tennis coach, busy woman, I eat, you know, not me. So Mm. I had a lot to learn. And my eating was probably disordered for many years. I was a D1 college tennis player. There was always a strong connection between food and exercise. Mm. And I didn't realize how disordered my eating was, but even more disordered were the thoughts surrounding food and exercise. And in preparation for writing my memoir, I went back and read all these childhood diaries and journals into adulthood. 
And there was so much evidence right there in my own words, in my own handwriting. Mm -hmm. So clearly this had been brewing for a long time, but it was actually a perfect storm, I call it, that happened in my 40s that ultimately led to the diagnosis of anorexia. And fortunately, I was headed down a very dangerous path, but fortunately was taken off that path early enough that there were no medical complications. My treatment was mm -hmm. outpatient. And I wish we had had in Rhode Island where I live, IOP, PHP at the time, but I would have had to leave my family, my kids, right. and my life. And I didn't know that it would have been okay to prioritize my recovery. So I had a lot to learn, but I was you not know, For, for our me. listeners, I, I just I want to put into perspective a couple of things if I can, right? So first of all, if I'm right on the timeline here, right, when you would have been sort of at the peak of your tennis playing and your coaching and all of that, and possibly the most symptomatic, you know, even when you were younger, right, there really was nothing. I mean, there was very little treatment. I mean, I'm not asking your age, but I'm not, I'm not Julie Louise Dreyfus, but, uh, you know, <laughs> like even early 80s, let's say, there was very little yeah. until later. And I don't think, you know, I'm not giving anybody a pass here. I'm sure there were people who should have noticed, right? But it wasn't in the conversation the way it has been in the last, oh, I'll say 30 years, 25 years. Yeah. I mean, is that your experience? Definitely. And I would say my disordered eating was more a habit, a way of life. I didn't know there was anything wrong with it. Yeah. until it escalated to, which led to the diagnosis of anorexia. But certainly in the 80s, when I was a college athlete, we didn't even, I mean, Karen Carpenter died during that time. Yes. That was probably the first time I ever heard of anorexia as a serious life-threatening illness. But my own diagnosis was still many years yeah. away. So but I also think with older women, there's a lot of shame and secrecy, yes. Yes. even more so than younger women. So I hear from women around the world, and so many are too ashamed to get the help that they need and deserve yeah. because yeah. of their age. I want to drill down into that. You read, there's so many issues that you brought up, right? One is athletes and disordered eating. The other is this idea of this perfect storm, right, mm -hmm. that led you to, okay, this is a problem. And I want to drill down into that perfect storm because I think people don't want to admit, like you said, the shame. And so it's important for us to see what does this look like? How do we know it's time to send up the flare? Yes. Now, that's a great question. For me, the perfect storm was a combination of a few things. One, in my early mid 40s, I was diagnosed with moderate to severe asthma, completely out of the blue. I'd always been healthy, physically healthy. And all of a sudden, I started having all these bouts of shortness of breath. I had always had anxiety surrounding health and safety. So now all of a sudden, I had to learn to manage a physical chronic illness, take medication every day. I had barely ever taken Advil for a headache. Mm -hmm. And around this time, and this is really important, is I'd just gotten back into tennis after 20-something years of not playing after my college tennis career and I lost weight I didn't need to lose, lost weight I couldn't afford to lose, became very fit and muscular, got a lot of positive comments. Yes. And also I was used to being this on the go, busy mother of three. My primary focus was taking care of everyone else's needs. I didn't know self-care was a thing. I didn't know I had needs of my own. So when I was diagnosed with asthma and asthma kept me off the court, because of these very bad flare-ups. And I'd just gotten back into tennis, which once again was fueling my self-esteem, becoming a huge part of my life. The eating disorder really took hold. I developed this intense fear of gaining weight. And I felt so out of control with this chronic physical illness. I felt like a failure as a mother because I couldn't be the on-the-go mother I was used to being. So I don't know if any one of those things was missing. Would I still have developed clinically diagnosable eating disorder? But I also, at this time, was diagnosed with anxiety and mild depression. That goes back to my young childhood, and it wasn't even diagnosed till around this time. So all these things 
were the culmination of so many other things, but became the catalyst for healing. Yeah. Thank you for laying all that out. I mean, it, it's so generous and vulnerable of you to do that. Anxiety and depression are always present. It's a bold mm -hmm. statement I'm making, but in all the years that I'm doing this, more than I'd like to admit, I've yet to see someone who didn't present yeah. with acknowledged or unacknowledged some level of anxiety and depression. And I actually sandwich them together because to me, they're sort of two sides of a hand mm -hmm. that travel together. Mm -hmm. So that you, you rarely have one without the other. Maybe one is more prominent, right? And so just as a psychoeducational moment, right, let's talk about this idea. How does it develop to begin with? It develops because it feels like a good idea. It's something that will help you cope with pressure, mm -hmm. anxiety, how, you know, real and imagined. But however you perceive pressure, however you perceive whatever is being asked of you, especially as an athlete. Yes. And I also want to just give mention to this idea. Shout out to all the coaches of the world, especially in the Olympics right now as we're taping, that really are goal-oriented, that want the best result, that want to teach, that want to have a good result. And they need a lot of education because there are things that are said mm -hmm. that really just start the whole process of self-doubt, disordered eating, body image distortion. I'm wondering if that was at all your experience or whether you were surrounded by that kind of influence? Well, I can answer that question with two scenarios. One, growing up, I felt a lot of pressure. I learned early on that it made my mom very happy when I did well in tennis. So too often my happiness was directly dependent on whether I won or lost a tennis match. And I felt like I was letting my mother down, disappointing mm -hmm. her if for some reason I lost a tennis match. So that just fueled that drive for perfection, achievement, success, which as we know is very common in leading to disorder eating. Okay. Eating disorder is a way to cope. But honestly, as a high school tennis coach, even though I coached at the high school level, and I did this for 13 years, retiring three years ago when my book was, came out, but I always emphasized to my athletes that they were human beings first. Mm. And obviously, I wanted them to do well on the tennis court for our team's sake. But I always told them at the very beginning that I care about you. I'm another adult in your life who cares. And yes, I want you to do well in tennis, but I care about you as a human being first. So if there's something mm -hmm. going on in your life, I'm another adult you can talk to. And I'll give you an example, which goes to the anxiety and depression that we talked about and also how common it is in high achieving individuals, athletes, whatever. I had this woman on my team. She's now long out of college. She was beautiful, smart, athletic, successful in multiple sports, and she suffered from severe anxiety and depression. And she came to me because her parents had said to her, what do you have to be anxious mm -hmm. and depressed about? And I think that yeah. is so profound and says it all. Yes. And it's just like it the does. Olympic athletes. There's all this glamour and medals and publicity, but... Yeah. At the end of the day, they're human beings and they have struggles just like everybody else. And everybody needs somebody who understands that and recognizes that. But for me, I was able to recognize that in others and help others. At the same time, I wasn't able to give myself that care and compassion. Yeah. So Betsy. here I was a good coach, but I didn't know self-care was a thing for me. Sure. Yeah. And you have learned it at the same time as being an antidote for others. And what you're talking about is so powerful, right? This prevalence of societal anxiety, right? There's the athletic anxiety, but we get it from our parents. We get it from school. And when you were talking about the perfect storm, like what were the things that led up? There was a couple of things you said before you even got to anxiety and depression, fear of weight gain, fear of feeling out of control, and fear of failing as a mom and all of those fears, right? That's all anxiety. And that yeah. isn't coming just from the tennis court. It's coming from our world, 
that says, this is the size you're supposed to be. This is what being in control looks like. This is what being a perfect mom looks like. And so I think it's so important to expand, to really dive into the, to the world of athletics, but expand like it's not just that. We're getting it from everywhere, that pressure. And for women, as they listen to your story, to not go, well, to not, I wasn't an athlete. I'm not, it's not like that for me. We don't have to be athletes to be impacted by the incredible pressures of society. And so I'm so grateful that you've been on this journey for yourself, but also to offer it to others. Thank you. It's very gratifying to be able to share my story, which is not extraordinary. It's actually very ordinary. And so many people can relate to many or at least some aspects of it. But my anxiety, depression, all of that goes back to young childhood and has nothing to do with having become a Division I college athlete and coach. It was the environment I was raised in. And honestly, I'm surprised I didn't develop a more significant eating disorder at a much earlier age. Mm -hmm. It's important to say that diet culture plays a role here, doesn't it? Yes. We're talking about uh, later onset anorexia. And we know there's so much later onset other forms of disordered eating, mm -hmm. whether it's bulimia, whether it's binge eating. And frankly, I think so many travel the full spectrum from anorexia to binge eating, and they sort of bounce between all three areas. And I'm so fascinated by what you went through to finally in midlife to say, okay, I guess I have to do something about this. Like this is real. I mean, it's inspirational for other women or other people to be able to say at a certain age, like, oh, okay, I'm not 15, but by the way, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what it was like for people in your world at that time, right? Your family, your colleagues, your friends, you know, wh whoever was in your world, when you finally said, so guess what, everybody, this is what's happening and this is what I have to do. Well, what was that like? Well, I wish it were that simple. I wish mm. I could have admitted my struggles, mm. but I didn't know it was okay to be vulnerable. That's something I learned early on in my recovery journey, that mm. vulnerability was necessary. I grew up in a home where vulnerability was equated with weakness. But it was actually a physician of mine that noticed the weight loss and it was weight I couldn't afford to lose, didn't need to lose, and called my primary care physician and said, you know, I'm very concerned. I think Betsy needs to see a dietitian." And of course, I held on to that number for months before I made the call because I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. This is how I had been for as long as I could remember. And I was diagnosed with anorexia at my very first appointment with the dietitian who specialized in eating disorders. And like we said at the beginning, I was absolutely shocked. How could I have anorexia? I'm a woman in my mid to late 40s. This can't be possible. Right. And I also had no idea that my eating disorder wasn't about the food. I had so much to <laughs> learn. And I am so grateful for, even though my treatment was all outpatient and probably took more years than it would have had I had the benefit of a higher level of care, I'm so grateful for that outpatient team that I had. But I have to be honest with you, when my brain was so consumed by thoughts about food and exercise every single day, I wouldn't have known how to let somebody in. Even my own husband, and I've been happily married for 33 years, he certainly knew about the diagnosis, came to one appointment, but and he always said, I don't know how to help, but I didn't know how to help him help me. Mm -hmm. So even though I was surrounded by a loving family, wonderful friends, a busy life, I felt very isolated as an adult woman with an eating disorder, and I didn't feel comfortable sharing it with anybody. I had always been a very private person. I had always been the listener, the caregiver. Mm. I felt too much shame to share with anybody. So I really lived these two parallel lives and I didn't allow them to intersect till much later on in my journey. There was 
that one road doing everything I always did and that other road, you know, being that good girl, going to all my appointments, dutifully trying to mm-hmm. follow my treatment team's recommendations. And that's what's so ironic that I've put my whole story into words for everyone to read. I was a very private person. And now to be so vulnerable and have my whole story out there. What's that it's like? It's an incredible feeling. I will tell you the word that comes to mind now is freedom. I mm. was so anxious just when I released the cover of my book on my social media three months before it was published because I was so worried. What will people think? They'll know that I had an eating disorder. I had told so few people. Mm. But again, I learned early on in my recovery journey that vulnerability was actually a good thing. It was a necessary thing. Mm-hmm. And I had to undo decades of seeing vulnerability as a weakness. And mm. that vulnerability that I finally gave myself permission to experience led to the life I live now, being able to live life completely authentically and no longer mm. worry about what others think. And that's why now being an open book, literally, just gives mm. me freedom, freedom to be me, freedom to use my voice, freedom to live authentically and be fully present and most gratefully able to help others learn from my own experiences. Extraordinary. There are those who would say, well, wait a second, wouldn't you have reached this point anyway, just by virtue of, you know, getting older? Don't you just start to not care what people think? Oh, if only it were that simple, (laughs) right? I mean, we, you know, we become older versions of ourselves, and hopefully we evolve and we learn and we integrate, but we're still the 11 year olds that we were, right? So it's really such a bold and brave journey, not only that you went through, but that you then decided to share. Betsy, I want to just touch on something that you have touched on, which I think is an important thing for our listeners. You've mentioned different levels of care, and you went through deep outpatient care and you said, you know, you're wondering, would it have been a shorter term thing had you gone through higher levels of care? Maybe, maybe not, right? The higher levels of care, as most of us know, involve either a sort of a residential or a hospital setting where you're somewhere 24-7 and obviously you're having meals taken care of and lots of therapy, lots of groups, lots of nutrition, psychiatry, all of that. And then in an ideal world, you step down to what you called partial hospitalization or PHP, which is sort of same thing, less of it. It's sort of like a nine to seven day, but you go home at night. And then in an ideal world, you step down to this IOP or intensive outpatient program, which is again, sort of the same thing, but just less of it, where it's sort of like 12 hours a week over three days. Most people cannot do that. Some people have to, if it's really quite, quite acute, but if they don't, they can, it is important to be part of a very robust outpatient team. And it sounds like that's what you did. And I don't know that the trajectory would have been any different. It's about readiness. It's about motivation. You were certainly, you know, ready, it seems. Well, we'll never know. We'll never know how my journey would have unfolded. I just know it wasn't available to me here in Rhode Island. And I wasn't willing to leave my family or disrupt my family life. But I've shared my story at many treatment centers around the country at all levels of care. So I've seen firsthand the benefits, Mm -hmm. but I've also seen firsthand how incredibly difficult it is. And then when they resume their life and come out of that 24-7 environment. So for me working on recovery in the context of my daily life. And again, I was medically stable throughout, and I always emphasize that because it's critically important. I was able to do my treatment outpatient. Not everybody is physically well enough to be in that situation. Hmm. But I've seen it all. But I just have to point out as far as the levels of care as well, I hear from so many women in midlife who do go to treatment, but they leave prematurely and don't get the care that they need and deserve because they're so much older than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they become the mother figure and it's about taking care of the younger patients rather than prioritizing and focusing on their own recovery. 
I hear that over and over again from readers that they leave treatment prematurely or they won't even go in the first place because they feel like nobody there will understand the stage yeah. in life that they're in. Right. This and is a critical so point you're raising. Is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it is exactly a critical point that you're raising that the vulnerability of eating disorders at this age, right? Dr. Margot Main talks about these two times of a woman's life when we're most vulnerable to disordered eating and eating disorders, when we're moving into fertility and when we're moving out. And what you're talking about is that the system is set up to respond to those moving into fertility. Oh, yeah, it's a young woman. But moving out of fertility, that midlife time, our society goes, oh, no, I'm not so sure. And then if it is impacting us, we step into the system and go, this doesn't fit. This is not a one size fits all kind of experience. And so then, and we've been trained by then to be in service of everyone else. That's part of the problem. Like you said, you didn't even know what self-care was. You've been trained as a caregiver. So you go into an environment where everybody needs care. Great. I know how to be a mother. Let me do that. Yep. Betsy, there's one thing I want to reel back to that I think is really important to underline in what you said. You said it just, it wasn't about the food. Like I didn't recognize it because it wasn't about the food. And I'm wanting you to say more about that because I think a lot of people might be listening and going, well, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm eating, I eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So can you say me. more? Right. Can you say more yes. so that people can go, oh, and no, if this is yes. resonates. That's a very important point. I'm glad you circled back to that. Yes, I was one of those that ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean eating disorder is not about food? What I learned is that the behaviors with food are the symptom of what's going on inside. And it doesn't matter what the behavior is. For me, it was restriction and over-exercise. For others, you know, whether it's binging, whatever it is, that's the symptom of what's going on inside. And for me, it was primarily a result of decades of internalizing any and all emotions. Mm -hmm. And I was never given permission to feel. I felt guilty if I felt even a, a negative thought or emotion. I thought I just was always supposed to be positive, which meant that meant I was strong. And it takes its toll after decades. Okay. So I like to say I probably went to those early appointments with both my dietitian and therapist as if there were a brick wall in front of me and it took their professional expertise to break that wall down brick by brick by brick and to go back and talk about the difficult experiences in my life. I also didn't know that trauma could be emotional. Mm -hmm. And I had gone through a lot of emotional trauma. But because there were so many blessings and privilege in my life, I didn't know it was okay that I could also feel sad or angry or upset. I thought I was just supposed to be positive and happy and grateful. I didn't know that conflicting emotions could coexist. Mm -hmm. How about that? So those are all really that? important lessons I had to learn. And that is directly connected to the eating disorder, not being about the food, but my be behaviors with my food, mm -hmm. restricting and over-exercising were a way of numbing all those emotions and coping with the emotional trauma that I had experienced. Betsy, I have to share one anecdote. When I started my own journey of healing myself, I literally opened a book that had a list of feelings. And I was like, oh, you're allowed to feel these? I didn't know mm. that. You're allowed to feel disappointed? I thought that was my fault. I was disappointed, right? You're allowed to feel angry? No, no, that was for somebody else, right? So yes. what you're talking about is so relatable to me. And I'm sure many is making space for feelings, right? And especially when you're brought up in an environment where, mm, hold that in. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was modeled for me from a very young age that when something traumatic happens or life-changing, we just go on as if nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me at the age of seven when my parents were divorced. So it was modeled mm -hmm. for me at a very young age that, here we have this life-changing event, but we don't talk about it. We don't ask questions. We don't express feelings. We just 
go on as if nothing happened. And that's what I learned to do from a very young age. So you're allowed to have gratitude and emotions at the same time. What an earth shattering concept, right? Imagine learning me. that for the first time in my late 40s and mm -hmm. early 50s. But that's a common experience. It really is a common experience. I mean, we hope we're a little smarter. We hope that the children that we raise hopefully get a little benefit. But you know what? Everybody is on their own trajectory, right? Yes. You mentioned the word trauma. I, I can't let it drop without giving it a little more discussion because, again, you're highlighting for so many people in such a vulnerable way that trauma comes in all forms. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the top three that we think it might be, right? And so it is emotional. It is physical. It can be sexual. It can be deaths. It can be early deaths, grief. I mean, there's no shortage of sources of trauma, and we do internalize them. There's also intergenerational trauma. What you're talking about, with due respect to all who preceded you, <laughs> what you're talking about is this ethos in your family, which was just undercover. It's okay. You don't really have to feel those things. Just move on, move on, move on, move on. Keep looking forward. Keep looking ahead. Keep your eye on the ball, right? Mm, yes. And lots of people are raised in environments like that, but that doesn't Especially mean- Especially our generation. Yes, yes, of course. Our of generation course. of women. Yes. Yes, I think so. I've said this before, but, you know, I remember seeing Gloria Steinem at a, a conference, and I'm bastardizing this terribly, but what I remember her saying was something like, okay, so listen up. I said we could do it all. I didn't say we had to do it all at the same time. You know, what, what, she, what she was trying to say was, you know, we somehow think as women that we have to be all things to all people at the same time. Well, ironically, she was a classmate of my mother's at Smith College, but my mom was the all or nothing thinking. As mm. well. And yes. that was what I thought was the way we had to look at the world. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I mean, that was the lens, right? That yeah. was the lens. So Betsy, as we wrap up, I'm wondering what you would want to say to women who are struggling right now. I would say the last line of my book, which is my message, my words, is it's never too late to be a work in progress. Mm -hmm. No matter where we are in life's journey, no matter what we've been through, it is possible to heal and become healthier in mind, body, and spirit. But the second part of that phrase, we're always a work in progress. I don't believe there's a period at the end of the sentence or a finish line. We can always evolve and change and see things in a new way and become healthier inside and out. So it's just a simple phrase, but I think it really encompasses it all. So anyone out there who's struggling, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Help is available. You have to find the right help, but it is possible to heal no matter what we've been through and no matter how long it's been. Mm. And Betsy, tell us the name of your book once more. My book is The Longest Match, Rallying to Defeat an Eating Disorder in Midlife. Fabulous. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. I'm truly honored. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Her Story on a Plate. Keep in touch with us at herstoryonaplate.com. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time. 